All right. Great. Well, thanks for joining me this morning. I know once for gardeners, once the the sun is out and we've got that weather, it's sort of always just getting out while we can. So um, thank you so much for being here this morning. And I'm hoping to follow up a lot with uh, what Denise did last month. Um, and then just sort of letting you know the kinds of things that I started learning about when we're wanting to support our pollinators, our native pollinators and bees um, that I wasn't aware of. And just, you know, making slight tweaks in our gardens and landscapes, I think can really help support them, not just by having all the beautiful native plants, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are into already and probably know a lot more about them than I do. Um, but I would like to just talk about how the backyard, um, mainly the backyard and in the front yard now too, got set up uh, because of growing mainly food for myself. And so basically, oops, hang on a second. Holly, my slide is not moving right now. Let me see if I can. Um, let's see. And I'm not being able to get out of it at all. Let me see. I'm just going to stop my share for a moment. Go for it. And then just see if um, it can happen another way or. Maybe try to reshare it. Yeah, I'm just going to reshare here. Technology, <laughs> always a challenge. <laughs> we had it working. We had, it's right. always, always a challenge. It's okay. Okay, so let's see if we can go again here. Is that there now? Yes, it yes. is. Okay, great. So basically, I'll just talk about how I came into having a garden in the first place, because I'm fairly new to this as well. Um, and then we'll go a little bit about, I think many of you, if you've been into native plants, you probably know a lot about the relationships of the bees and the and the native plants as well. But I'd like to go a little bit more into what we can do to support them a little bit as we go through. So basically how I came into it was, you know, through a yoga and meditation practice. Um, I, you know, I do daily uh, practices and basically one day I would know that it would feel really great and another day it would feel really, I would be stiff and sore. So I really started just looking at my foods. And so as I was doing these practices, why was it where my body would just be so sore, I could hardly move or stretch. And the other days it would just go really smoothly. And so I found that, you know, just having a daily practice that I did, I was able to monitor and just looked at what did I eat the day before um, and how I felt that next day. And so that sort of started the whole process for me of um, paying more attention to the foods that I ate and how they impacted my body. Um, or sometimes why would I be grumpier and more irritable too? <laughs> so uh, I need all the help I can get. So these tools have been very helpful for me with that. And of course, what I found is that, um, you know, <laughs> if I ate more fresh foods, uh, whether and especially greens and things introducing a lot of the greens and eating fresh fruits and vegetables was the thing that sort of um, when my body felt the best when it was the lightest and I also had a lot of health issues that were coming up just similar to uh, the rest of my entire family on both sides of the family um, having diabetic indicators having uh, you know, high blood pressure, having some precancerous polyps and things like that. And so I was following in the footsteps of all of my relatives who have all sort of died from cancer or heart attacks. And so just seeing if I could uh, switch anything just by changing some of the lifestyle things I was doing in terms and mainly through eating and how that impacted my body. And so I came to, you know, organic foods and things after no, noticing where certain um, chemicals or preservatives and canned goods or dyes uh, really started impacting me with rashes or I would be breaking out and things like that. So I started shifting all of that uh, to eating more of those greens. Um, but I was sort of in a financial situation also where um, I was coming out of a relationship. I had some very difficult financial situations. And so uh, organic food was really expensive. And so, uh, you know, eating 
eating a lot of the things that came out from the garden or subsidizing a lot of it, um, again, as Holly was saying, I never quite realized how impactful that would be uh, until I realized that it really uh, um, supported most of my food. I had many other things too, but um, eating much more fresh uh, or just eating foods that have been cooked and eating them immediately, not having leftovers or um, foods that have been preserved for a long time because they'll have le less life in them. And I found when I did so, I just had a lot more life energy to do everything. Um, and so I felt stronger, I felt better. Uh, and I, you know, didn't have the need to sleep as much. So all of these things really uh, were impactful for me in terms of how I lived. And then, um, you know, there's great fortunes of things, you know, because I had a previous yoga student who came to my classes, she wasn't doing as well at the at the beginning and quite depressed. And so I invited her to come along uh, just because I had space in class and, you know, was running anyways and thought, you know, being around people maybe could, you know, just facilitate things, getting the body moving. Um, and so I we had moved down um, to Atlanta to support my son with his soccer. He was pretty passionate about that. So we were trying to look for more opportunities for him. Um, but when, when he was off in college, I knew I wanted to come back to a community that we had sort of built around the studio. Uh, and so this woman had basically gifted me this home to continue offering a lot of the yoga and meditation and just sharing the um, food and healthy ways of living with people that I had been doing. And so all of a sudden I had this um, home, you know, I didn't need, I didn't need furniture and things because my living room turned into my yoga studio or meditation spot. And so this is how a lot of it evolved. Everything was donated or picked up, you know, secondhand from different things. So I'm hugely grateful to people for um, their support. And so this home had this amazing backyard um, all grass and basically this was the first year uh, in 2015 that started with a tiny little garden on the um, right hand side through there and then this was the garden about three years later where I've you know I it was really to grow my own food uh, but then as I started finding out more as all of you are probably aware with the native plants and how it supports a lot of our pollinators and things then um, you know I, I was learning more and more so these are the kinds of things that I was hoping to share with you with what I've done in my own backyard and so this is a an overhead view of my property because again it's just a urban or residential property uh, in the North Linden area of Columbus and basically um, you know it's about uh, I think 50 feet by 140 feet or something like that. And um, this is the wintertime view. So you get an idea because the house is right there. And so the front yard on the right and the backyard on the left. However, if we go to the summertime view, we have all the leaves filled out in all of the trees. And so I have this beautiful, amazing oak tree that basically covers the house and um, half of the backyard. Uh, the silver maple in the front tree, which basically covers the front yard from the sunshine. Um, and then on the south side where this blue line is, is a line of trees from the neighbors and the building. So I do not get any south um, sun at all. And then on the north um, west corner, my neighbor has a walnut trees and some trees over there. So what's left is that tiny little backyard inside the red lines there. <laughs> um, and so it doesn't get very much sun at all, probably not till 12 or one o'clock in the afternoon. And then by 4.30 or five, um, the shade trees are coming from the neighbor's trees. And so I basically get about, you know, if I'm lucky, maybe four to five hours of sunshine um, in the backyard. And so I didn't realize, this is how little I knew about growing anything, um, but I decided I'd start with this permaculture food forest, which basically when we're, we're simulating the forest canopy, basically. And so we have, you know, the tall, the tall canopy, sub canopies, and basically all of these different layers so that, uh, none of these plants are necessarily um, 
competing with each other, but that they all kind of uh, complement or grow together very well, uh, just like mother nature. So we're trying to uh, incorporate what would be a little more like a, a, the food forest edge or um, uh, when I chose the, the perennial uh, plants that I wanted to grow for uh, the food in my backyard. And so in the backyard, um, you know, the tall canopy, that pin oak, I think is over 70, 80 feet maybe. And then what I chose for my food plants, um, although pin oak has those acorns, uh, the squirrels are after them all the time. Um, so I usually don't get many, if any, to eat for myself, because I know you can make some flowers. There's a huge process of them. But I do have a Chinese chestnut, which is sort of my tallest one. And then the next layers, which will be the hazel bushes um, or hazelnuts, uh, elderberries. And then the bushes, which are the next lower level of the uh, mainly the berry crops. So that I have some red raspberries and black raspberries, the currants, gooseberries, and goji berries. And then, you know, there's are some sort of grasses or ferns. Asparagus is very fern like. I've been trying to choose more perennial plants because then you don't have to plant them every year. They require very little care once they're established. And so, um, you know, then I have a lot of herbs and things that also have done quite well in the garden because uh, they're not sort of exposed in the open. And then uh, there's also the, you know, the rhizosphere, the underground part where I've now incorporated some Ren cap mushrooms and shiitake log mushrooms because they grow on the substrates from my maple tree and the oak tree oak trees are great for shiitake mushrooms. And so those have been incorporated in the garden this year and using everything. And then you have those ground covers like yours, the strawberries. Uh, and then my annual garden, basically, um, I've divided up into sort of four main plant areas, but they will provide a lot of that, which is, again, simulating that forest canopy. And if I can just have a moment, could I just ask people just to um, turn off their microphones just so that we don't have the interference of the sounds. And I think that will help with the sound quality. Uh, and then we can un unmute as needed if there are questions after. Thank you. Looks like we are all muted, Diane. All right, great. And then, um, so with the oak tree as the canopy, uh, I was told my oak tree is about 175 years old. I don't know if this picture is going to move for you. It's moving on mine, but it shows that I've left all of my leaves on the on the ground. Uh, and so uh, basically, you know, the I was really lucky because this oak tree, you know, like Doug Tallamy has been talking about is one of these keystone plants. And basically, there are a few keys, a few plants that are integral in supporting the most pollinators are providing sources for the uh, host plant, being a host plant or sources of certain um, nectars or pollen sources, that um, kind of thing. And so basically with that, I leave all the trees in my backyard. And so I'm not sure if this, is it moving for you, Holly? Um, but basically- it is not. Okay, but this is a video basically which is just showing that my lawn is entirely covered by the leaves, um, which I keep in the backyard and then it just goes up into the trees. Um, so that, uh, but as you know, many of the larval sources may uh, use those leaves to either eat or build their cocoons in. They will drop down to the ground just under that tree and then basically either stay there hidden and, um, or, or uh, burrow into the ground where they'll overwinter. And so I leave all of my leaves on the ground in the backyard because I have fences and people don't have to really be so much worried because my neighbors have all these very pristine, carpeted, beautiful looking lawns, but they're not used to my more uh, natural ways. And so, um, you know, having those leaves around is, is really good. Um, the other, actually, the other thing with the leaves too is I don't, mow them. I know many people will mow them and use them for their compost, uh, but because of all of these um, pollinators and sources like that, I leave my hole and then I can show you what I do in some of these other places. Um, but with that, I overwinter the yard and 
you know, maybe some of you do that as well, leaving your native plants up and the stems, especially with the berry plants, they have that really um, soft pith in the canes. And so it's very easy for those native bees to burrow into them where they will then collect all the pollen on several trips and then uh, lay their egg and then seal it off depending on what kind of bee it is, whether it be a mason bee, they'll do that with mud or with uh, leaf cutter bees, they'll do that with leaves to line their little cells. And so those individual cells are built all the way through those canes and the stems. And I know many people might not like the look of it. I don't know why we've turned nature into something that's ugly uh, when it comes to urban settings, but I'm hoping to reclaim some of that. And if you can't do that, and this is in the front yard because I I'm trying to transition things a little more slowly in the front yard, <laughs> but basically if you can leave areas where the leaves can drop, for me, I was just lazy. I didn't wanna cart all the leaves to the, the leaf corral in the backyard. Um, so basically I use this area. Uh, and then the other thing is just to mention here too in the front yard is I've lined it up and a lot of these logs or pieces of wood uh, 30% of our native bees are cavity nesters. And some of them, besides the stems, they will use um, old beetle burrows or they'll burrow their own holes into the wood. And so it's also great, you know, habitat for other spiders or other insects as well. And then, so the other thing though in the front yard, when you have like something that's outlined, it provides a little more like a cue of care. Um, there's a lot of research that had been done with Mary Gardner up in the Cleveland area on some abandoned properties where they were trying to check with some, you know, the uh, planting native plants in there and how it might work with some of the pollinators. And they found that if it has that cue of care look, so some of these things like outlining it, um, or I tend to leave my lawn growing quite tall, again, just to support those native pollinators. I left the pathway from my porch near the house there to the neighbors across so that my male person can walk across through there. So just trying to accommodate the different things. And then the signs, this is for a Monarch Way Station and the um, Wildlife Habitat, Certified Wildlife Habitat. Uh, they are basically checklists. Many of you may know that you can go through if you create the habitat sometimes with water sources or with monarchs with a lot of the larval host plants with the milkweeds. Um, you can go through a checklist and then it makes you eligible for these signs. And basically I put them in the front and they've been really wonderful tools also. So if you're in a urban setting where things maybe people keep them a little neater or they're not used to these ideas yet, um, I found them very helpful because they'll walk by the ladies with their dogs. And, um, and so basically, you know, they'll ask me about it or people have come to my door just to check in when they see some of the other plants that are coming up. And then you'll see I have a, a, a huge cistern on the left there. It's a 300 gallon one calculated. It, it was donated to the Sunny Glen Garden. And as the calculated with the roof off of that 864 square foot home, half of that roof, basically if we get one inch of rain here in Columbus, which is kind of a typical uh, downpour, it will fill up that um, rain barrel, which I can then use to water plants if it's needed. Uh, and that way we also prevent and improve our water qualities of our streams and rivers because that first flush of water that is sent out into, um, you know, just falls on the ground, it'll flush everything. Our fertilizers, any chemicals that we've used, the, the gas that spills from cars or lawnmowers, doggy doo doo, whatever, it will get flushed down. And any of that water that then goes down the side of your street there into the grates at the corners will go directly into our streams and rivers. And basically by, you know, with your native plants, letting the water kind of absorb and soak in or rain barrels just to hold some of that water there so that first flush doesn't go through will also be supporting and improving the water quality of our stream, local streams and rivers. Uh, and also, so around my backyard, I also have just piles of wood, um, stumps that we had from people who said, if you pick this up, you know, you can have them and we use them for stools sitting around the yard, but also, you know, they great make good mushroom, um, 
substrates and then all of these spaces that you'll create by just piling up pieces of wood that I've collected that just fall out of my trees. And so it gets used for firewood, but these piles are created then that these um, cavity nesting bees will then use to build their homes in, in and around. So if you can have a few of those around, um, the bottom right one is actually a bumblebee abode that I built with just some leftover pieces of wood. I don't know if you can see it in the snow, but it's actually an upside down clay pot. And basically I put it up on the roof of it to cover the entrance. So the, the upside down clay pot is upside down or, or it's upside down. And then the hole in the bottom of the pot, which is used for drainage is now on top. So that becomes the entrance for the bumblebee ab abode. Um, the bumblebees usually like to nest. Um, they've been finding them just underneath the leaf mulch in the ground, which is another reason why we like to leave our leaves as much as possible. And so they will fly in and, um, and then go, that provides a little bit of cover for their area. And I've also used, because all of the clothes that I wear are all natural products, um, almost all 100% cottons. And so it doesn't have those plastic or polyester fibers. And that way I can use the, the dryer uh, fluff <laughs> to put inside that they can use or grass clippings that they can use. And I sometimes just line the bottom of that with some stones or gravel so that just making sure it has some drainage um, so that it can be there. And it needs to be there for a fair amount of time so that, uh, you know, because bees will need to find them one year and then they'll be hibernating or, um, like, you know, that. But bumblebees tend to use old rodent um, you know, burrows and things like that too. So basically, you know, if you have a little more wildlife, uh, you'll be probably creating a lot of that uh, natural, naturally for the bees as well. And just to speak about this is uh, when we look at the bee hotels, because I know many of them have been popular, which I'm excited about that people are, uh, you know, looking into these things and, and wanting to support more native bees. But um, I brought, I, I felt kind of bad, this one was gifted to me. Um, and I had, I was doing a presentation for them on, on supporting bees. And, um, and then they sort of realized that this, we were making a joke, I said, this is, you know, the bees have uh, rated this uh, a one star hotel because of the features many of them are be much too short. Um, this one is like four inches long. And a lot of the bees um, need a minimum of six to nine inches. And part of that is some of these cavity nesting bees that will use those tubes in there uh, will lay sometimes females first and then the males towards the end. I mean, if you're chopping them off real short, there's gonna be an, um, an imbalanced distribution of the females to males with that as well. and. Uh, and the other thing, I, I think they're, they make wonderful sort of educational tools so people can learn about them and talk about them. But if you can have, if you're using bundles, um, you know, one to two dozen stems together, but making sure they're a minimum of six to nine inches. And if you have a range of diameters, not all neatly the same size, I think that, um, you know, if you're just sort of copying nature, I think that goes uh, very well with that as well. And so placing these hotels with the entrance, just like with honeybees too, facing the south or southeast so that they can warm up as the sun comes out because a lot of the bees, um, honeybees are kind of at our exception uh, to the whole bee population. Um, they can create heat in their hive as they work together. The bumblebees can fly out in cooler weather. I call the, you know, our um, honeybees are kind of our nine to fivers, <laughs> um, but basically, uh, we want to keep those hotels off the ground to avoid that moisture seeping in and then, um, you know, having a little roof so that, again, the water doesn't get in as well. But when you have these stems left in your yard, uh, especially if you leave them upright uh, or if you, you know, have to do it, just leaving at least 18 inches so that they can use that, um, those stems there. Uh, these will also need to be left out sometimes a year before the, the current bees can find them, lay their pollen and eggs in them, seal them off, and then um, when they come out for the next year. Uh, but just like any hotel or like for people, if you don't, 
they need a lot of care and cleaning and you have to know the timing of things as well. And so I usually recommend that people just see whatever they can do to do things naturally in their yard so that they can support that. Um, and that way you won't have to worry so much because a lot of times if you leave them also in the same place, uh, they'll get a lot of parasitic wasps that will come and just kind of basically provided them a nice little um, buffet. So, you know, those are considerations if you're looking at hotels um, to consider. And then, um, you know, with the leaf corral, Stephen just made this out of some leftover, um, leftover uh, wire from a project that someone had and so we just set up a leaf corral right next to our compost bin and that way when we put our food scraps in we just cover it up with some leaf mulch from there and because I leave those leaves whole I know it takes longer to break down but basically we leave that in the from one fall season and either the next spring or the next fall um, it is broken down enough where I'll use it over the garden or like you'll see on the bottom in the middle picture there on the bottom that beautiful hummus and that's what um, you know can use be used in the garden and so the rain and the um, air can circulate and get in there hopefully if there's any uh, caterpillars or cocoons <laughs> that have been there they'll be able to come into maturity and leave the leaves um, leaf nest there uh, uh, to, to continue on uh, with that. So these are just sort of other options that we've looked at um, in, our, in the backyard. Uh, the other, other thing is then, you know, the leaf mulch sometimes will go whole onto the garden beds. And especially in this summer, I found that when I put it on just before that big summer heat, it retains a lot of the moisture in the garden um, and, and it also you know, provides the nutrients as it breaks down and builds the soil tilth in my heavy clay soil backyard. And so it's been very useful in so many ways and that way in case there's a few remnants of some creatures left in into those leaves, they'll be able to leave and come out through that. And so, so much more <laughs> diversity came in uh, that, you know, the last year or two, um, with the first couple of years, I had some issues a lot with pest management uh, and, you know, with aphids or some other um, different, like the Japanese beetle. But now that I have so many more bugs and caterpillars around, I'm getting so many more birds. Uh, and so they've actually become a huge part of my organic pest management because I haven't had any of the same issues, especially these last two years. So we'll kind of see how things go. But uh, I'm learning, you know, I haven't, I was also kind of creeped out by a lot of bugs and things, I think just by the way I was growing up. And so it's really fun to get back to nature and just kind of really be fascinated by all of these wonderful, amazing creatures that we have in the backyard. And so, so not only did the, you know, the diversity of insects and bugs come, but then so did the people. Uh, and I found, you know, having children around was one of the best ways to um, educate the adults, <laughs> basically. These fellows came, I would send them home with some kale or collards. And, you know, the third time they came, you know, they were, they were just munching on things in the backyard. And, uh, and then the third time they came with their parents and they had had some health issues too. So we were able to start getting some of the, our neighbors um, set up with some well. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the thing when it comes for native bees, many people are really afraid of them. And, you know, I, as you learn, learn about them, the large carpenter bees, those people are familiar with that. But if you, usually they're not flying really, really fast. And the males, they'll have like a yellow mustache on the front of their face. And so you can actually capture them and hold them in your hand. I'm sure they're not too happy about that. But for one moment, just for the kids, just to get to see it, because none of the male bees will sting and they don't have that modified ov ovipositor on the back. And so once they sort of realize that and just feel the buzzing, uh, it's a great sort of tool to introduce uh, kids to it. Or like a lot of the sweat bees uh, that are now in my yard, they're 
they're shiny and beautiful and they'll land on my skin when I'm working out or it's a hot sweaty day just to drink off my skin and so if I don't like swat or bash them where then they'll feel threatened then um, I don't get stung I, I haven't been stung this whole time and I have so many not only honeybees but native bees in my backyard and so you know you have to be more careful when it comes to the wasps uh, they tend to be much more aggressive, especially some of the paper wasps and things, or when, if you come near, you know, they won't be happy, or you'll find that a lot of them will be nesting in groups underground. And so if you've accidentally mowed over them, a lot of people have been attacked by that with coming out. So I think oftentimes bees tend to get a rough rap when it comes to getting stung, because those are often attributed to our more aggressive uh, wasps and hornets um, and uh, but the native bees as well like what I told people if you're really afraid is just like with my meditation just close your eyes and take some deep breaths because a lot of the bees will pick up on your stress levels and so if you're calm and relaxed uh, they'll tend to be calm and relaxed too uh, and you know when I had some honeybees before I was you know it sort of makes me think like well you know, no wonder they might get upset. We're taking off the roof of their house. We're pulling out their walls. We're pulling out their babies. And we sort of wonder why they might get upset. All their food's being taken out. And so even with the honeybees, I was able to, I, I did wear protection, but um, I was able to work with them where if you stay calm, um, they often don't get too upset because they don't seem like anything's there to worry about. And if you close your eyes and take deep breaths, that will facilitate your relaxation response. And hopefully the bees are just coming to check you out. The other thing is, especially when it comes to honeybees, I don't know so much about the native bees, but um, I was using a homemade lemongrass uh, laundry detergent. And so unbeknownst to me, I walked in the house and I had seven or eight <laughs> honeybees follow me in. So I just you know, caught them in containers and let them fly back outside. But those are kinds of things that you may want to consider if you're working around bees. Um, they might be just checking you out to, you know, they think you're a flower with all these floral essences. So just be aware of that, um, that that could make a difference when you're out and about or checking things as well. Um, and then with the community, I just wanted to point out a little bit because here in the Linden area, um, we have some of the highest rates of infant mortality, um, life expectancy is down, you know, unemployment, um, the amount of education, and it makes it very difficult, especially when COVID came around and we saw the huge imbalance of food distribution and those possibilities. It was really difficult with our food pantries to watch how much food, truckloads of food had to be wasted because we, we just didn't even have the people to transport it from the trucks to the pantries um, for our neighbors. And a lot of these areas, you know, they're much more challenged. And so it does, you know, it makes sense when all of these things are there that they will have a much more stressful time of it, uh, especially when they don't have access to grocery stores that are nearby. A lot of them don't have transportation or they're using buses, which increases their risk of COVID. So to me, there was just a lot of issues in our community that I wanted to see, can there be anything in terms of what I was doing that could help change that? And so not knowing much about how to grow seedlings, I because I would, in the permaculture garden, I would grow seedlings um, in the basement downstairs so that they could get a little bit of start going into the garden. And I'm doing, and I really enjoyed that using that with plugs for um, native plants as well. But then I grew 4,000 organic vegetable seedlings in my basement so that basically it was a fundraiser um, which helped pay for the organic soil and the organic seeds uh, and then, and the pots and things like that. And then I was able to donate the rest of those food um, plants to some of our local community gardens in these areas, especially in Linden, uh, who then was the idea that they could get some of that fresh food and produce uh, grown organically to the people in their neighborhoods, since I can't really do it all myself. But the garden became a little bit of an educational um, tool. And then 
you know, part of it for me has been a huge thing in terms of zero waste lifestyle and eliminating plastic and um, packaging and things like that. And so I really, what I grew in my garden was also was for my health, but also how can I eliminate packaging? So a lot of my garbage, if I looked into it, are packages from potato chips and things like so growing them was like okay then I can make and grow them without having the packaging and I really try to see can I've been thinking about it for a year or two can I really see if I can go without a car it's so convenient and how I use it but I wanted to really focus on living locally which I've done you know for the most part and so uh, I really bit the big one one you know, a couple years ago and said, okay, no more car. Um, but then it would be really helpful. I would, I just need a bicycle. And then, you know, I went to a garden club meeting and they had a, a, a raffle uh, and I won this wonderful um, mountain bike. And so then I had no more excuses, but it became everything, you know, people around the community saw me because I'd be carting around the honey you know, extractor or bales of hay from Oakland nursery, uh, you know, my water, my yoga mats and, and cushions and things like that, or would uh, carry the Tulsi or the tomato plants uh, to support city folks farm shop. And so all of these things, you know, it, uh, I, because I'm working from home, it was a really wonderful way. And I also found that then people were so willing to just um, for classes and things, um, support me with just um, at rides on their way there or back or I have friends who are also into zero waste lifestyles who are willing I just you know book my time with their car with them and so able to do that without and then saving on insurance and gas and all of that and it, it actually by having what I thought would be a limitation I felt like it opened up so much more for me in my life in terms of how I wanted to live and what I chose and so that's um, worked very well. Uh, and so with the community, we ended up becoming a little bit of an educational um, gar demonstration garden. And so again, we, you know, we're now having a seed saving project for a lot of our vegetables that are adaptable um, so that they can be here in this area. And then learning how to seed save them appropriately so that we can then share those seeds amongst each other. And in the little free library that we have in front, it's for books, but also now for seeds and, and seedlings and then trying to find a way to keep it uh, environmentally friendly so uh, people gave me their you know I make my own yogurt or <laughs> cottage cheese now if I need it uh, but also just eliminating more of that because I find it brings up too much mucus for my um, yoga and meditation practices but then using leftover uh, or recycled plastic bins to make the plant labels for the sale and then finding all kinds of containers uh, they don't have to be the plastic ones and so the ohio wounds reformatory all these amazing partnerships um, folded 2000 paper origami pots for me out of newspapers and so instead of sending people home with these little plastic pots that ended up in the landfill that they would throw away we had volunteers who put them into these um, paper pots and they could then take it straight home and plant it directly in their garden as the worms would eat that up. And then I had to compete when we had different events, uh, you know, with the candies and maybe some of these other, um, you, you know, when you, when you have, when the nearest place to you is not a grocery store, but it's more like a gas station food store that has no fresh food in it. There's all these packaged candies and things. I had to try and find a way that might make it a little more exciting when I, <laughs> competing with that kind of food that they're used to and so you know trying to make barbecues out of you know blueberry charcoal or um you know the veggie train was really popular because literally it was a train wreck um but trying to make it a little more fun or also just you know trying to eliminate the use of plastic forks and things with the porcupine watermelon because the wooden toothpicks can be uh, reintegrated back into the compost and things like that. So really looking at how to reach people in different ways um, in keeping with the environmentally friendly focus where I wanted to leave, you know, with the house and everything, wanting to leave that, um, reduce that as much as possible. And so when you're eating these fresh foods, again, we used organic 
all organic methods. I've never had to use pesticides in any way, shape, or form here, but using some of these other things. So if you have a vegetable garden that you're incorporating with your native plants, uh, I basically then took each sort of four, four to five areas that I now have that I rotate and have grouped my vegetables, just like native plants have, grouped them into sort of similar families that share maybe the same pests and diseases. And then I rotate them every year. Uh, and that way uh, I have eliminated, I think probably 90% of the pests that come to them. Uh, but then also trying to find different ways to do it through you know, um, the companion planting. So you'll see a lot of my native plants and then the food plants all mixed in there, you know, with a lot of the um, greens or the collards, kale, broccoli, um, cabbages with the some of the marigolds or you'll see some other herbs and things in there because the herbs are very strong smelling plants. So they tend to uh, um, keep away some of those pests that might be a little more sensitive to it. Uh, and I just think it it's kind of fun, but I don't plant in neat rows because I followed the contour of the land because we had huge flooding in the land. And so that's where my native plants will go around the little sort of rain garden area, but also because I've used swales so that instead of my lawn flooding every time it rained in the backyard, um, these swales were perpendicular to the slope of the land. And so basically the water captures into there. It doesn't run all my seeds off and saves it. And that's another uh, way to keep things moist, but also, you know, that valley of the swale creates a sort of mound or raised bed technique uh, that I use for my vegetable crop. And so, and I will try anything when it comes to organic. I think all of you know the cabbage uh, butterfly that munches a lot of our Brassicaceae family with the cabbages, kohlrabi, collards. And so when you know your pests um, and when they come out, when Denise had talked recently about phenology and when the sequence of when things come out based on the heat and the amount of heat that's building up or in, uh, over time. And so, you know, these, the cabbage moths are territorial. So the idea was if you create other cabbage moths through these paper paper ones, and I just thought I'd try it because I have a lot of kids in the garden. It's a really fun project. And we just taped some dental floss because we didn't have any other string in there. And then basically what we did was tie them to some sticks in the garden. And I don't think you'll be able, yeah, the video is not working on here, but they, it was so much fun. They're fluttering in the wind. And basically they're twirling and swirling around. And basically every plant that I had one of these over had very few chomps out of it from the larvae of the, of the cabbage moth larvae that eat it. And so it has become a, a, a tool that I use every year. And just cause it's kind of fun when people come in. Uh, and then because we had to do things cheaply, uh, you know, to, I don't know how many of you did if you're doing beds for native plants and things like that, but we did it with sort of these, you know, newspaper advertisements come cheap in the mail. We, as most of them are soy ink, uh, and then cardboard is for free that we can get from a lot of these big box stores that do a lot of appliances for large areas. And so doing kind of a, a layer mulching very thickly, uh, I used to turn the grass over or but I found just on smaller properties, it was easier just to leave the grass where it was. You don't disturb the seed bed and then laying the newspaper um, very thickly and overlapping and then the cardboard. And that really has done really quite well because then I started with the native plant plugs, very young. So taking, you know, two to three years to establish. But instead of seeds where you leave, um, I found for people, you need to know a lot more about native plants because I couldn't tell like weeds from, from native plant seeds. And so, you know, if they're growing there, it made it more difficult for new people to come into native plants. And so I found this technique has worked really well for urban folks and it doesn't cost a lot and they can get started on those native plant beds. Uh, and then just to make a note here of, this is like a, we had to do some observation for a, a, a class I was doing where I followed a bee around. This is, uh, I, I don't know if you can tell, it's the, the uh, driveway is on the left and the street is on, is the gray area near the top. And then the health strip is the area between the sidewalk and the street. 
And that's where I started just watching. In this case, it was a honeybee. And you'll see how I just tried to map it over the flowers that I have in the front, the native flowers in the front and you follow their path, but then it would just stick around a plant that they found resources that, because they need to be efficient. If you're trying to gather a lot of pollen or drink you know, nectar sometimes to keep yourself hydrated, then uh, it, it makes sense to be efficient and go to the plant that has the best resources. And so a lot of people like to do beautiful patterns in their yard. Uh, Native folks probably don't, you know, it's easier to, like nature does and often grows in, in more kind of clusters or clumps. And basically what we're seeing here is if you plant in bunches, it makes it very efficient and effective for them. And honeybees and the larger bumblebees and carpenter bees, they can fly like three, three to six miles for honeybees. And so they can go farther for their sources. But the native bees, as we go through, they're much tinier. They're very little. Sometimes I didn't even realize what they were, uh, that I couldn't even see them or I didn't even realize they were bees. But they're smaller. And so they need to have their food source within sometimes three to 500 feet or 300, you know, within the area of where they're living or where their nest is. And so having the proper habitat is even more essential. If you're covering everything up with the wood chip mulch or that kind of thing, they won't be able to get into the ground as easily. And so sometimes if you can just leave those bare little patches right nearby, like this year I had um, Peponapis prunosa, which is a, a bee that, uh, it, it's a specialist on a lot of the gourds um, and melons. And so basically, but they will build their nests right nearby or underneath those uh, plants. Uh, and so, uh, but I found that I had the native bee that came with those as well. So when you know that, you know, I don't till the yard uh, at, because when they build those cavity nests into the ground, if you're tilling that up, you'll be disturbing a lot of the, their bee nests and they won't be surviving. And so the layer mulching and the leaving spaces, areas of ground, or just leaving some leaf mulch around, uh, I think, just like in nature, can support the native bees in the best way. Uh, and this was also just, you know, as I learned more about the native milkweeds or plants, you know, being larval sources. So just like for the monarch butterflies where their, you know, milkweeds are native, uh, are their hosts for the larval, larva stage, uh, I realized very soon that when I only had one plant and then you have seven or eight caterpillars munching down on it and they don't have enough food and so you know just one or two plants here or there they often talk about with migra migrating uh, uh, monarchs or birds even too like if you can plant sort of on a north to south stream so as you're flying above you know they're being larger groups and they recommend like at least a hundred um, or at least 10, a minimum of 10 milkweed plants. Uh, if they're kind of bunched up, it's easier for them to see as they're flying by. Uh, but I think anything at this point will be, will be helpful. And so this is um, the swamp milkweed, which I have in my yard where it's pretty wet. On the left, those beautiful pink ones. The top right one, um, that looks like it has these little claws that uh, close up, that is uh, the poke milkweed, which is one of the only milkweeds that grows in partial shade. And so in my backyard, that works out well too. And then the butterfly milkweed in the front yard I have where it's a little more sunny um, is what I have with there. All right. And then, uh, you know, these were just talking about the signs I was talking about, I think can be very helpful in terms of creating that cue of care and when something is very different for especially in urban yards where they might be used to like my yard where everybody is pretty pristine carpeted <laughs> lawns um, that have nothing else growing in them. Uh, my neighbor used chemicals on her lawn and nothing grew on my side of the fence for eight inches where her water streams on my side and my rain garden I came into native plants at first because the water would pool in that one area and then the water would just, you know, just seep into the ground there. And so that's where I turned it into a rain garden and put a lot of the native plants that are really good uh, filters for 
for uh, the a lot of the chemicals and things like that, hoping that if they could ab absorb and um, neutralize some of those chemicals with the native plants, then I could plant my food outside of that. And hopefully that would be a little more protective um, with that. Uh, and then we just had some really wonderful partnerships. Uh, the wood, you know, was also very useful in lining up the pathways in the garden because when you get 50 or 100 people coming on tours in the backyard, as many of you know, if clay soils are already heavy and compact, compaction is just going to make it worse. And so lining the path so that people would at least just stay in one area and not trump and harden everything down uh, really helped the backyard as we went along. And then um, it was really nice for us because Stephen and I don't have a TV. We don't have, we don't get the newspaper in. It's been kind of depressing. I just sort of, you know, if, I check in it once in a while, but um, I, I want to be aware of what's happening, but I just found too much of it was there. So basically, um, we were covered by some stories in the dispatch and 10 TV. And so my neighbor who has all of those things, you know, then saw what we were doing and she really switched, you know, what what was how she was treating me with the, the lawn and under, you know, every time they would be outside, we'd talk about something else. They no longer spray their yard. They're providing us with all their leaf, leaves from their trees for our leaf corral. Um, you know, their daughter is now working at Oakland Nursery. And so we have this wonderful partnership where we're sharing that uh, rain barrel in between the two houses for her, her garden area. And they've been you know, very supportive with that. And so having these um, partnerships with that, she is a, a yakker and she was beautiful in spreading the word for us too, for our, for our sales and things like that. So it was, um, it's been really wonderful with that. And then the Green Spotlight Award, uh, you know, for me, it's really been how can I, you know, there's always gonna be an impact with living with everyone, but when you see you're much more can be a part of it instead of the either or that, you know, what impacts the creatures we do really does impact us as we're seeing now. And so if I just found, if there's a way for what I'm doing now to be a little more inclusive of everything involved, uh, then we can see how, how that goes and um, it's done well. So now, yes, so after all that, <laughs> but those were ideas I wanted to point out to you for people who have properties, the kinds of things they can do with that. And so we'll come more now into a lot of these bees um, in terms of, you know, many of you I think are familiar already with how important they can be and what they, um, you know, a lot of the berry crops I found, uh, I have tremendous amount of berries. Uh, I leave the canes up, you know, usually they tell us to uh, clean out all the canes, old dead canes, and, but I leave all of mine up and every single one of them that I left up last year, you can see a tiny little hole in the top, which means some of these cavity nesting bees have used that to lay for the next generation. Uh, and I have tons, to, I was just looking today, they're flying all around. Excuse me, I have the hiccups. Um, but the berries you'll see, uh, you know, with a small berry patch. And, you know, I also participated in a citizen science project where with some peppers, green peppers, because they're self-pollinating, but we covered up one with a fine mesh net. So it still let in the sunlight, the wind, um, but it wouldn't let in the pollinators. And basically then we compared the number of fruits, you know, or peppers that, that were uh, produced on the plant. And then also looked at the number of seeds and that was enough to convince me just from my little six plants that they had us do uh, the difference in terms of how much more pollinators can contribute to increasing the yields on a lot of these things. Or if you see like on strawberries or raspberries, um, each of those little bumps on them is a tiny little flower that requires pollination. And so you might get funny looking ones if they're not properly pollinated. Uh, with that. So having a lot of the neat uh, native bees, 90% of them are probably better pollinators than our honeybees, but all of our research has been done on pollinators. And so a lot of the foods that are produced um, can make a difference. And 
I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but this is a picture that was done with Whole Foods. So if you look at all the bins along the back, all the containers in the front here that are full of food, if we didn't have our pollinating um, bees, we'd be missing, you know, this is the food that we would be missing without them. So some of them are totally dependent on it. And as I was saying, they can be very helpful in pollinating, uh, increasing pollination success uh, with, with the others. And this, uh, I had done, the kids and I were looking at some of them trying to see, I don't know who would eat this kind of oatmeal breakfast with the raspberries and, and cantaloupe and things or almonds. Those are supposed to be coffee beans with orange um, drink. But if this is, again, we were looking at breakfast with bees and breakfast without bees, you can still get a few pollinated coffee beans, but not much. So, you know, just it just brought up some more. And for all of you, you know, with the native plants, 75 to 90% of them need uh, pollinators to, to uh, continue the species. And 25% of our, our native bees are considered specialists, which means they will only be able to collect pollen from specific plants or specific families of plants. And if right now with climate change, some of them are coming out earlier or at different times because they usually are timed because they've evolved over, evolu um, over many, many years together. Uh, they, they time a lot of their timings of when they both come out, they'll come out when, when those flowers are in bloom. And so that's uh, important that if that timing is off, we could, not, could lose our native plants as well as our native bees that uh, uh, feed on them. And then again, just so many of the other wildlife that depends on it uh, for seeds or become seeds, uh, food sources themselves. And this is just, I didn't quite realize like how much, this is from 2010, but basically just to farm income, you know, there, honeybees are a huge industry right now. And we'll talk a little bit uh, because that's what most people know about the honeybees, but native bees are, are, they're also looking into. But a lot of times when we have the domesticated honeybees or they're using a lot of the bumblebees in greenhouses to uh, pollinate tomatoes or peppers because they have the specific quality or they're large enough to be able to get into those plants in the way that's needed or buzz pollination so that um, because the honeybees can't do that. And so uh, a lot of times the, the domesticated uh, bees that are used in this way then get a lot of these pests and diseases and then they go out, you know, if they're out into the rest of the environment, they will then infect our native um, plants. And so that's what we're seeing a lot of times happening with that. Um, but with the honeybee then, um, I, you know, we know so much information about it, I think because we use them for their honey. Uh, they, you know, so many, uh, they need to fly to so many sources just to create that one teaspoon of honey uh, for that. But they are actually non-native, uh, yet most of our information is all about the honeybees. Um, but they're like me, they, they're immigrants and they kind of incorporated or naturalized into, into the space. But, with honeybee pollination, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar that we will literally ship the honeybee hives. It's a huge industry because um, they will ship them to, for example, um, to pollinate the almond crops when they come up or then to shift to the blueberries or then to some of the other um, melons and things like that. And so they are literally set in these places and with the almond crop, 80% of our entire honeybee population is shipped over there. And they're all there at the same time. And I don't know, like you, we've kind of learned like COVID, you have them all close together. They're, you know, put in those fields because they come back and they pollinate just that one crop. And how many of you, you know, if you're eating off just one food for weeks at a time, and then you're carted and traveling to the next place, uh, and then put in another space where you're just pollinating only one other source, uh, you know, it, 
I'm just thinking how unhealthy that can be for them when they don't have sort of all of these sources to be able to go to and then um, spreading those diseases. Uh, it's a little scary in terms of, you know, our entire bee population could be wiped out just as we're seeing, you know, COVID with, with our, our things too, it can have a greater impact. And so, you know, seeing if we're using the bees in this way, then seeing maybe if we can look at the native bees and how they might be able to fit in or facilitate things. And so, you know, I think many of you are also aware of the, the bees that have been in decline. Uh, so much of that, you know, they, it has come down just to habitat loss and use of pesticides and climate changes. Um, but most of our research, like we said, again, has only been done with honeybees. And so, you know, we started it off in 1980s with about 45, um, four, four million, four and a half million honeybee hives. And now down to, you know, two million uh, in 2005. And then the colony collapses, uh, which are still prevalent. Um, honeybees, I found when I had them, they need so much care now because of the they don't have the kind of uh, survival built up to deal with a lot of their pests like the mites, um, the disease build up as well, they're less healthy. And I feel like the way that we're breeding the queens uh, to have qualities that are more helpful for us where they're less aggressive and so maybe don't sting uh, or they produce a lot of honey. Basically, I feel like we're basically like genetically modifying them so that they're less capable of surviving and so and also there's a lot of research now that's been going on that when you have honeybees uh, and native bees together that uh, there'll be less native bees but that makes sense you know if you have very little pollen and nectar sources or food sources or habitat uh, and there's competition for it then uh, you can see how that could be impacted so even though we know about the honeybees, we're not really so much sure about the wild bee decline because we don't know very much about our native bees. But, and it depends where you look because some bees are, native bees are generalists, which means they will feed on many different kinds of flowering plants for their nectar or pollen sources. Whereas our specialist bee needs that specific plant. So that can have an impact. So some bees might be helped, some bees might not. But I think that if you're, like all of you have been planting the native plants, I think that's a huge way to go for supporting uh, native bees in general uh, uh, all the way through. So the more that you can have that wide range that covers from spring to fall as the native plants do with your spring ephemerals and then the late blooming ones especially because that will be helpful for before they go into hibernation. But uh, our rusty patch bumblebee is our first native bee that was uh, considered or went on the endangered species list. It used to be prevalent in, in Ohio here, but has not been seen since 2010. Uh, and it's known for its little red rusty patch on its back there. Uh, but health of a, of a healthy ecosystem is very often indicated, bumblebees are often a very good indicator of that. And I have um, five species of bumblebees uh, in my backyard now and so a lot of them there's some posters and things that you can see that will help you identify it by the color of the stripes or the back uh, so that you can begin to identify them bumblebees are easier i would recommend starting with bumblebees because they're larger they don't tend to fly as fast as some of these tiny ones so they're easier to see and so um yes and so all of these are factors which is why you know, when we have so much land, I think 80% uh, of the land east of the Mississippi River is all privately owned. And so if we can have homeowners like all of you planting native plants and creating some of that habitat or leaving some of that habitat, I think that can go a long way also in supporting a lot of our pollinators. The other thing I wanted to mention, because this has become a, a big issue, a lot of people are using those solar lamps to light their pathways, and which is great for us for safety. It probably looks very pretty, but so many of our pollinators are uh, 
I mean, it's like people, if you sleep with your light on all the time, you might not get a decent rest. And also we have a lot of pollinators who are only come out at nighttime to pollinate different things like your evening primrose. primrose. Um, and so, you know, they will fly to these lights. I don't know if you can see in these photos and they basically will exhaust themselves thinking, you know, this is light, even the lights from a city, that skylight uh, can be an issue as well. And so if you can, I would recommend um, turning off as many of your lights or all of them if you can and letting it stay dark so that our nocturnal pollinators uh, won't have this issue. There's also things that when the nocturnal pollinators come out, the way that they pollinate certain plants makes it available for different um, daytime pollinators in a different way. And so there's a lot of research going on now that this can be a huge thing. Or if you need to do it with lights, having it so that they're on motion detectors, so that when you use it, it'll turn on, um, but it won't be on the rest of the time. Or if you can, if you have to have lights, using an amber, a yellow or red color, um, they tend not to be as attracted to that. So if you can use yellow or amber light colors um, for your lamps, that can also um, be a little more helpful than having the bright, the bright lights. Uh, and I think this was attributed to Albert Einstein that you know we would cease to exist in four years without them. Uh, so I, I don't I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, also there's a new uh, bee advisory box if you're if you do use pesticides. So look for it now because it will a lot of the times we just if you have to apply things, doing it when the bees are inside at night, for the most part, for the pollinators, although you, know, you have your nocturnal pollinators too. But uh, for the bees, they'll be out when it's sunny. A lot of the native bees won't come out when it's rainy or cloudy, uh, as well as the honeybees. Uh, bumblebees usually still come out whenever, though I found them hiding in the flowers of my um, blazing star just to hide out from the rain. Or stay dry from the rain. But look for that. Um, most of our mosquito sprays you can get on their do not spray list for, with the city because the two, um, the ones that they use here in the city, both will kill all of your pollinators. I mean, even though my bumblebees are inside, I think some of that still is there when they go out in the morning and they, they try and spray at night, but the bees, you can tell they've um, had poison or chemicals because they'll all have their little poor little tongues stuck stuck out and um, are um, just a dying patch of the honeybees in front of the hives when right after a spray. And so if you check with the city of Columbus, you can ask to be removed from the um, spray. I know the spray for mosquitoes is helpful for some of these health issues. Uh, but we created a whole urban area when I was living with some friends in Clintonville with the entire block because they try to not spray them within 150 feet if you say you're organic or you have native bees or pollinators, that kind of thing. So you can check with the city. They all, they, you know, sometimes they can't do that, but that can be something then that you can spray. And then if you're keeping it native, you'll be attracting your birds and things so they can take care of a lot of the uh, mosquitoes or you know, for you in that way too. And so um, any guesses on how many species of bees there are um, in the world? If you take a moment, but we have about or so 30,000 or so many of which we don't quite know about yet. And in Ohio, uh, we just did the Ohio bee survey last year. So we'll have a better idea. Um, but there's about 4,000 species in the US and about 450 to 500 in Ohio of native bee species. These are bees that are not honeybees. And so there's quite a few of them uh, around. And in our bee survey, we'll have a better idea. It was our first statewide survey. And, but because of COVID, we couldn't do the pinning parties and um, bee identification. So there are very few people doing that right now. But now we're looking specifically at native plants that uh, have specialist bees that pollinate with you. So I'm excited that all of you are growing your native plants as it will be supportive in all those ways. But if you look at the number of bees by state, uh, you'll see as we go further west, 
that the numbers will increase. And so basically uh, out in, you know, the California area or the more deserty areas, they like a drier climate, the drier soil, that kind of uh, habitat. So uh, you'll find that there are a lot more out there. And then uh, you know, we're looking at sort of the family that the bees come from, uh, as they're affiliated with a lot of the uh, stinging wasps and the ants, uh, and so the, the wasps. But you'll see the section of bees on the bottom right, uh, all of these uh, different um, families, their genuses, and basically this is the honeybee. <laughs> So there are so many more bees again, but we mainly we only know about the honeybee. So we have seven main families of bees. I'm not necessarily going to go into all of these, but just so that you're aware of them. Um, the, a lot of the, um, the number three of the collected day, there's uh, right now there's the polyester bees. They usually form these beautiful little mounds of dirt um, with their holes and they will usually, even though they're solitary bees, they will be have their um, nests in clusters on the ground. So you'll usually, usually see them together, but they will line their, their uh, nests with a literally like a polyester uh, lining. And so it becomes waterproof when it's in the ground uh, for when they lay their pollen and eggs. The Helictidae includes a lot of those sweat bees, the, a lot of the green metallic ones that you'll see are really quite beautiful. Those are the ones that might come and set on you if it's hot and you're sweaty, um, just to take a drink. Um, the megacalidae are known because they have the pinchers, big pinchers on the front, and they use that to gather the mud or you know, to cut out little circles in your leaves or your rose petals to then gather up to make their nests. Uh, and the honeybees as well as the bumblebees and carpenter bees are in their apidae family. Uh, the mining bees are a lot of your ground nesters. And then there's the, um, the number seven, the Stenothridae, <laughs> I can't say it. They're only in Australia. Uh, and there's some um, bees that only collect floral oils instead of the pollen or, or with the pollen or nectar. And so when it comes to identifying them, it's really challenging because I want you to see these might look similar when you look in the, um, the vertical rows, but if you look horizontally, the top row are all wasps and the middle row are bees and the bottom row are flies. So I'd like to talk about a little bit about the features that might help you distinguish between them. Uh, just again, for as you start to get to know, know them. And so when we're looking at bees versus flies, if you notice um, things here, if you look at the top of the head, you'll see the fly has kind of little short stubby antenna, whereas the bee will have a longer one. Uh, bees tend to be in general hairier, although we have some parasitic bees uh, that don't have the hair because they use other bees nests to lay their eggs in. And so they don't need to collect those um, pollen for them. But bees in general will be hairier. They'll tend to have a little more rotund uh, roundness to them uh, as opposed to the flies. And the flies will have those big eyes that kind of meet on top of the head uh, and are a little larger. So these are the things that you kind of might notice for telling flies against bees. And also, you know, it's hard to tell when they're flying around like that, but um, the bees, uh, the flies will also have one set of wings or two wings, whereas the bees will have two sets of wings or four wings. So if we're looking at this, can you just see which in the first row you might consider B, which will be this one here, Bombus fervidus. And then in the second one, here's a B. That's a bee, a colorful bee here, honey bee, and then um, some of our other uh, uh, chlorine bees. But the reason why it's also difficult is because of you know how we're sort of seeing things. Like this is save the bees, and does anyone know what that that picture they have on there? That's actually the cicada. I, I and many of you might know we're having that 
the cicadas that come out every 17 years come out in their flush this year. So, uh, you know, the, it has nothing to do with bees, but yet we're promoting that. And even on, you know, the puzzles, we're telling our young children, the puzzle they say of, you know, the snack bee and a flower is actually, if you look at the big eyes, the short antennae, two sets of wings, or two wings, and that is one of our um, hoverflies. And so we'll take a little quick look at wasps versus bees. This is the neck and the head of a wasp on the left and the bee on the right. And even around that yellow area, you might be able to see a little easier the hairs, much more hairs on, on the bee. And the wasp has hairs, but they might be finer. And so a lot of times people will say bees have like split ends because they have <laughs> a, lot, a lot of hairs in that way. And uh, in general, wasps, if you see this front one, it looks like it has silvery kind of uh, on the face that will almost always be a wasp. And also you can tell a lot by their behavior. And so, you know, wasps, because they feed on other uh, insects or bugs or bees even, uh, they're, they, I call them the meat eaters. <laughs> they will tend to be more aggressive. Um, they'll be looking for other bees hanging around. Um, and so there, whereas bees, like the queen bees that are coming out now will be very low to the ground and they're searching for nests to build because they, they are the sole bee that comes out. And if without that sole bee, if something happens to that one bee, we'll miss their nest and the propagation of you know, 250 maybe of those bumblebee species that continue. So um, the, the, uh, the bees being a little more vegetarian, like in terms of their collecting the protein for the pollen sources. And all, both of these will be on plants to uh, drink the nectar. And so wasps versus bees, uh, you know, again, it gets a little trickier. These are your uh, bees. And some of them you'll see, they look a little bit like wasps because wasps tend to have those really tiny, spindly, skinnier waists. Uh, and they'll usually have um, a lot more claw, like things to grab their prey and hold their prey. Um, but also some of the other bees that we have may look like them, like the one in the middle there. Um, they're cuckoo bees that like our cuckoo birds will then wait till a bee has left their nest, go and lay their egg in that nest that has already been supplied with pollen and their egg will hatch first um, and either eat the bee egg or you know, eat the pollen sources. So, and those are some of our little mask bees on top there. All right, um, this is an organization uh, <laughs> that also says save the bees, save the bees. But as we just noted through here, then this is, you know, oops. Um, uh, you know, one of our, our wasps which eats the bees. So um, there's a lot of education, I think. That's why I wanted to go into ID sourcing so that as you learn more about them, you'll know a way to stay away from these ones because they will tend to be a little more aggressive. And then just to sh tell you, like from only seeing like a couple lightning bugs and a couple of spiders in my yard when I just had the grass, uh, this is what um, had flown into our yard. and. Um, this is a bald-faced hornet on the left, and these are paper wasps. They're kind of nasty, and they actually killed off my honeybee hive. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to have them, but maybe not in my yard. <laughs> but then this is, an, it looks like a bee on top, but again, it has short antenna, large eyes. And so it's a kind of fly, and it's an assassin robber fly. I took a picture of it. We'll talk about iNaturalist where all of these people who are totally passionate about these things were thinking it was so cool because um, they're, they're very rare. They've rarely been sighted here. And so uh, um, basically it's an assassin robber fly because it pierces the neck of its prey. It injects a poison which paralyzes it. And then uh, it disintegrates the insides or liquidizes the insides and they just suck it out. And so this assassin robber fly flew with this very heavy package away after I took this photograph. But uh, again, just as you increase the biodiversity as you are with your native plants, you'll also increase the diversity of the life that comes to it. And this one, if you wanna take a guess, this one is the, uh, 
sleep sheep one that I photoshopped here. <laughs> um, just because I'm just checking if you're falling asleep yet. Um, this is a one we count when we're trying to fall asleep. I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, ideas on how to catch a bee for BID. Uh, very often, you know, we have these nettings and things now where you can go around. So a lot of people just think it's hysterical because I'm running around my yard with this net just to, you know, go over the tops of all of my plants where a lot of the bees might be. But a lot of our native bees are really tiny because if you see the pipe, the silver pipe or aluminum pipe on the on the sucking thing I have, it's very tiny. And so they've also seen me go around the garden until I'm red in the face, sucking the air because I'm trying to suck these uh, bees into this container. There's a grid on it, so I won't suck them all the way up into my mouth and throat. But basically then it drops into that container and then I have some time where I can take some photographs or just get a closer look at them just to see what's there. Or for myself, you know, I'll put them in these containers once I've captured them in the net and then I'll put them in the in the fridge for half an hour so that or they'll cool down and then they slow down because they're you know they they will warm up that's why they come out only when the temperature is warmer and so basically i know if it's been in the fridge i have two minutes to put under my microscope to identify it by some of the you know the wing wings uh, venations and some other features on it but for us you know this is a great way to be able to take a picture because they fly so fast and so basically uh, this can be just a fun way to do it too. And I think when people wonder what I'm doing, then it creates some opportunities to talk about it. And so it's just another educational opportunity. So I'm I think thinking- this is great, Diane. We're coming up on 1130. I just wanted to let you know. So maybe if we could right. wrap up a little bit and sure. um, also give time for folks to ask questions. I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose anybody. <laughs> that sounds good. So um, I think that's basically what I wanted to say for you with there. And I think um, Denise talked about iNaturalist in terms of being a great way to put your pictures on there and identify it just for plants and for bees. And so that's one I really like to use for ID. And, um, and then again, a lot of our bees, oh, just want to mention I don't have to mention here because a lot of our cultivated plants basically might have a lot of the pollen and nectar sources propagated out of them. And so this pansy doesn't really have any nectar pollen sources for our native bees, but um, these little um, native bees found a different use for it as they're mating here on it. <laughs> so, but um, to keep open ground because they build their little nests um, into the ground. You can see it lined up through here with their life cycle. Again, in the wood, they'll be working um, into the wood if you leave pieces of wood. If you've seen your leaves all chopped up with that, um, with beautiful little circles, uh, those are probably your leaf cutter bees, which then come and fly into your pieces, your cavity nesters, or they'll roll it up and then create these little um, individual nests for each of their baby cells or baby cells that they have pollen or collecting things like from lamb's wool for the carter wool carter bees so basically i think that's you know keeping that open ground um i let if you have grown a lot of native plants you know let a lot of these just keep growing up in my yard um so that we because they come up for some of the first plants and then uh, I think I just wanted to, you know, providing food and shelter, limit your weed barriers, providing those cavities uh, and logs or twigs, I think are very helpful. And then, as all of you have been doing, providing all of those different flowers and shapes and colors in the spring and fall. So I think if there's some questions, I'm happy to answer any that you might have. Absolutely. We can put questions in the chat, folks, or since we've got a little bit of a smaller group today, we can always just unmute ourselves and um, ask Diane directly. I thought this was fabulous. I learned so much about, um, you know, gardening and making yourself sustainable on such a small plot of land. Um, I, like you, have a very small plot of land and um, have been challenging myself each year to do something different. So, you know, how many, how much food can I grow for myself and my neighbors? Um, 
it for just the small bit of land this you know maybe yeah. seven by five um bit right. of land that I have and um you know trying to companion plant as well so you can put in some native plants in there um in between some of that food that you're you know that you're planting for yourself mm -hmm. And I, I thought this was great as well as sustainability. Um, I am so impressed that you have no car um, and get around just with a bicycle and a, um, you know, a, a little buggy on the back for your zero waste lifestyle. That's quite inspiring for all of us to think about, you know, maybe, maybe if we don't take the plunge that, that much, maybe we could <laughs> think of, um, maybe we could think of a smaller way that maybe we could dip our toes in the water a little bit. Um, so you certainly inspired me. Uh, I loved the, um, the lavender and the, the, the sheep sleep or the sleep sheep. <laughs> I thought that was so <laughs> cute. Um, I have a question for you. Um, do you, do you update your gardens each year or do you try to keep things the same? Do you try to add to your gardens? Uh, do you have any grass at all? In your I, I do have grass because I, I still like it for areas where I, you know, people come over or kids to play in. Um, but because I have the permaculture food forest, so just like your native plants, I've tweaked it so that it just provides food for me instead mm -hmm. of maybe necessarily the more native plants or trees or shrubs that grow there. Um, but, you know, they're permanent. So they come back every year. And mm -hmm. I like it because things like sea kale or asparagus, you know, they come back every year for food. So I don't have to replant them every year. So it's just those annual vegetables that will switch and change. And I've always been adding, I don't have room, I don't think to add more things in my yard. And so that's why I'm trying to share this information so that we can create these corridors of native plants and just to see that there are different ways, like you said, of doing it so that you can have sort of a permaculture food, edible food forest with the native plants, but still have your annual garden. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so it does change with my annual garden rotating, but I, I don't think I can fit much in, but then I get <laughs> to share if it spreads. So that's the fun part of it. And, you know, um, selling a lot more native plants this year as well. So I'll have a lot of native plants that are ready in May. That's and awesome. When we have food projects, then, you know, they're supporting like a pollinator garden in the school behind me and uh, uh, getting a church um, in my area set up with a vegetable garden. I was able to obtain some heirloom seeds that are highly adaptable to this area. And so that we're really going to look at educating on seed saving so that, you know, because if you get that cross pollination with similar crops that I'm growing because I keep them for my organic pest management, there'll be cross pollination. And so if we can have some people grow, you know, one kind of brassicaceae and I grow the other kind of brassicaceae, we can seed save for those because those plants will are biennial or they'll come up in their second years, flower for the bees, and then we can save those seeds and then trade them. And so these are a lot of the projects that we're kind of working on right now. But um, and then just the online store that will have some of that available come me. Wonderful. Does anybody else have any other questions for Diane? Well, it looks like we're, uh, you answered all of our questions with your thorough presentation. So thank you so okay. much. Diane, um, oh, we've got one from Inside Out Pilates. You did all of this starting in 2005. 2015. 2015 ish. Okay, cool. So, and the, the permaculture garden started bare root. And so it took a long time to kind of get established. Um, but in, they say like in six to seven years, like the berries produce, you know, 25 to 30 pounds of berries for me. So they're easily frozen. So that's why I have, you know, I can eat fruits all year round. Um, but it's, and it's just fun to watch it evolve. And mainly it's kind of embarrassing, but because I knew so little about gardening or anything, um, I didn't realize that these plants would grow into huge trees because you see them as little. <laughs> and I think that's I think that's exactly what a lot of people think, you know. And when yeah. we, especially when we plant like an oak tree, 
<laughs> sure. Yeah. And we get it. And it's like this big, um, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Just, it's a good reminder. Just remembering. Yeah. Look up your plants and, um, try to, you know, um, I guess don't get greedy with putting so many in one little area. Right. Try, but try then, that, you those. know, also wanting to see that you can grow a, a food forest that supplies you for most of the year for your protein, firewood, um, and, uh, fruits. And that way, you know, it can be grown in a very small area because you take advantage of the kind of edge of a forest kind of thing with that. Yeah. And Elizabeth asks uh, if we'll be able to download your slide presentation and you will be able to, since this video is going to be on YouTube, you'll be able to click through, um, click through the slides that way. Thank you so um, much, everyone. <laughs> yes. How time. many this how many hours uh, weekly to maintain in the spring and fall? Um, basically, I weed twice a year um, because I, you know, when I do the leaf mulch, I wait in the till like in the time between just before the heat of summer when I know most of the things have come up and I can because I can identify them until they come up some more, and that way I might take turns mulching a certain area with lasagna mulching so that I don't cover up more than one area in case there are some other creatures or bees in there. Um, but basically the weeding happens twice a year with that leaf mulch uh, in spring and then in fall so that there's no open soil areas. Um, and then, but also I, I, did, I, have, I don't water my garden um, uh, in the back with the food because of the, I don't have to with the mulch on there, the leaf mulch. Uh, and then the permaculture food forest, the only time I spend in there for that now is, um, I don't prune them anymore because I had birds nest in there. When I pruned up my raspberry, they, it opened it up, the birds went away. So for a small lot, I'm happy to leave them, just leave all the stems up, leave those things open and just take away things that you need or, or want that way. And so I just spend time harvesting and processing, which and is sounds like you're the one that's doing most of this work correct um inside out pilates asks if your model's independent or dependent on helpers it sounds like you're doing most of the work if i this is me and myself for my little yard yeah that's awesome that's awesome well thank you so much everyone um really appreciate you joining us today and thank you diane wonderful presentation we're so excited to have you uh, stay tuned for our next Wild Ones of Columbus presentation. It's, we're going to have a special drop-in presentation next Saturday, uh, talking about April being Ohio Native Plant Month, um, as I'm sure many of you yeah. are excited <laughs> about. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, how that got started. And then we will have an in-person event at the end of the month as well. So stay tuned to our Facebook, our Facebook group, as well as our website. Uh, we're updating and adding all sorts of fun things um, and just getting excited about spring. It's here, guys. We're excited. So thank you, Diane. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.